So thank you very much to Hull and the Humber Chamber of Commerce for their partnership for this event, which has been organised by the European Parliament Liaison Office, which is based in the UK. They organise discussions around a range of to topics and across the country with MEPs and stakeholders and you, the public as well. So let me introduce our panel here today. Uh, we have politician, we have the CEO of Grimsby Fish Market, we have Barry Dees from the National Federation of Fishermen's Organisations, and we have uh, Jill as well, who's from uh, Dr Jill Wakefield, who's from the University of Warwick. We are approaching just a year before the withdrawal treaty comes into force, 29th of March 2019. All MEPs at the European Parliament, including UK MEPs, will have to give their consent to that treaty, and it has to be ratified by the 27 other member states. So it's just a year before that happens. It's not long. There will be no MEPs from the UK during the crucial transition period between May 2019 and December 2020. So I'm afraid you'll be out of a job, mm -hmm. Richard. So the crucial time is now to take action, isn't it? <laughs> You will have some contact details of your local six MEPs on your chairs. I keep saying join in, but how do you join in? You join in by asking questions. There's also a hashtag EP on Brexit, which is up there behind me, which if you'd like to comment on, on what you're hearing, that would be great on Twitter. And I would like you, when you ask questions, as JJ has said, if you could stand up to ask your question so the camera has time to look at you. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Dr Jill Wakefield. What she doesn't know about the common fisheries policy isn't worth a fish and chip wrapper, I have to say. Jill is based at the School of Law at the University of Warwick. She gets stuck into the nitty-gritty of EU law on fisheries policy and marine environment as well, and she's written extensively about the law governing EU fisheries policy. And she has a, a presentation for us. Welcome, Jill. Thank you. Um, I'm going to crack through this. So um, one of the main platforms for, Brexit, for the Brexit campaign was that the UK would be, take back sovereignty and exercise it for the public benefit, particularly in the area of fisheries. But legal sovereignty is constrained where there's a standing constitutional tradition which in the case of fisheries is the internationally agreed 1982 Convention on the Law of the Sea. This has rules on access to the seas and the use of its resources. As the UK takes back sovereignty over fisheries, the main issues that will have to be addressed include access to waters and markets, establishing a decision-making process for the setting of total allowable catches and quotas, and joint management for shared stocks. In the post-war period, UK fisheries policy had lagged behind a more forward-thinking approach to natural resource management and international relations. UK and North East Atlantic fisheries regenerated during the period of World War II, but thereafter exploitation, over-exploitation has led to a diminishing fish stocks and for the UK culminated in the Cod Wars of the 1970s. Our accession to the European Union rescued us from the international opprobrium that resulted from the intervention of the Royal Navy to force access to Icelandic fishing grounds. Thereafter, the EU institutions took over responsibility for fisheries policy on behalf of the member states, including the UK. This slide shows the extent of the UK's ec exclusive economic zone under the law of the sea. The UK must manage its stock sustainably at maximum sustainable that can be extracted from a fish stock while allowing its maintenance over the long term. The UK will determine the total allowable catch and where it does not have capacity to extract the whole, must offer the surplus to other states, in particular those states whose nationals have habitually fished in the zone. However, the UK would be entitled to require the landing of all or part of the catch taken by other states within UK waters to the UK ports. Stocks that occur within UK waters and the EEZs of other coastal states are shared and must be managed in cooperation with neighbouring states. For the UK, this applies to almost 100 stocks and agreements will have to be made with the EU and other neighbouring states. 
The objectives of the CFP are to ensure fishing is environmentally sustainable in the long term and manage to deliver socio-economic benefits. Operation of the policy is to be according to particular principles governing fishing activity, which are not found elsewhere in EU law. Sustainable exploitation is to be achieved through the application of the precautionary approach to management that will eventually restore and maintain stocks above MSY. The principle of relative stability is the principle that's caused most controversy. According to the CFP, the precarious state of the fishing industry and the dependence of certain coastal communities on fishing makes it necessary to divide fishing opportunities between member states, ensuring predictable shares for each. Although relative stability is declared to protect fishing-dependent coastal communities, in practice it operates simply to assure member states fixed proportions of quota share. With diminishing fish stocks, increasingly sophisticated technology replacing fishing crew and consolidation of the fleet, the protection of coastal communities has not proved possible. As a result, coastal communities are to be supported in diversifying their economies and creating jobs in sectors other than fishing. The concentration of the British fishing fleet was already underway at the start of the 20th century and continued following the inception of the CFP, with quota allocations passing to Spanish interests, among others. Much of the UK quota is foreign-owned, as are UK aquaculture and fish processing activities. Thus, fishing is no different to the rest of UK industry, large tracts of which are foreign-owned. Nevertheless, the fact team case destroyed any coherence the CFP may have had, Instead of the wealth attaching to the UK allocated fish quota accruing to the UK, it could be landed in any member state. These are the fishery statistics for Grimsby. Landings into Grimsby by the UK fleet are shown here, and those were worth under £200,000 in 2015. The landings of the under 10 metre vessels accounted to a paltry £22,000. Generally, while fish, processing, sorry, while fish processing provides the equivalent of about 18,000 jobs in the UK, marine fishing provides under 8,000 full-time equivalent jobs. About half the total fishery sector jobs are in Scotland, including most aquaculture. According to the Office for National Statistics, the next most significant region is Yorkshire and Humberside, which accounted for 11% of fishing industry employment, 6,500 employees in total. 36% of UK fish processing employment is located in Humberside, rep representing about 5,000 jobs. Generally, the fishing industry wants no part in the EU, while the fish processing sector is supportive of remaining in the single market. Grimsby-based young foods Young Seafood and Icelandic Sea Churl lobbied the UK government to give free port status to Immingham and Grimsby for seafood. This would mean that import tariffs would be inapplicable for the seafood coming into the area. However, it does not overcome the problem of standards and tariffs on fish exports from those ports into the EU or elsewhere. The contribution of fisheries, aquaculture and fish processing to the, to the UK economy is approximately 0.1% of UK economic output. The size of the contribution may be a significant factor in determining, in determining future fishery relations with the EU. On February the 28th, the EU published its draft EU withdrawal treaty. According to the EU, the CFP will continue until the end of 2020, but... With regard to fishing opportunities, the UK is to be only consulted by the Commission over both EU and international quota shares. The UK's response is that UK entitlements to fish quota shares will be agreed with the Commission in advance of meetings of the EU Fisheries Council. As to international negotiations, the UK asserts its right to participate alongside the EU and other coastal states. Therefore, this remains an issue for negotiation. On 7th of March, draft guidelines on the future relationship between the EU and UK were issued by the EU, Donald Tusk explaining that the, as the, given the UK will leave the single market, customs union and jurisdiction of the Court of Justice, 
it should come as no surprise that the only remaining possible model is a free trade agreement. But a free trade agreement will not offer the same benefits as enjoyed by EU member states and cannot amount to participation in the single market. The EU proposes a post-Brexit arrangement with zero tariffs on goods, but this is predicated on the maintenance of reciprocal access to fishing waters and resources. The government's white paper on fisheries is awaited, but it is to be consonant with the outlined 25-year environmental plan. However, the environmental aspirations are not su substantially different from those of the EU. So the UK aims to achieve good environmental status for UK waters, which is also the aim of the EU. If the UK rejects the EU's proposals for the continuation of the CFP provisions during the transition period and reciprocal access thereafter, the most immediate problem for the UK is tariffs. The tariff is determined by species and the level of processing. The herring tariff isn't shown here, but the herring tariff ranges from 10% to 18.3%. Although the UK imports more than it exports, with, reg with regard to the EU, it is a net exporter of fish products. The EU made a static assessment of the impact of Brexit on imports and exports, anticipating that both the EU and UK will benefit from increased revenue derived from the imposition of tariffs, but taking no account of the change tariffs will drive in behaviour of both consumers and producers. In summary, although the UK can devise a distinct fisheries policy, it is quite constrained by the requirements of international law and the need to maintain trading and other ties with the European Union. Thank you, Thank you very Thank you. much indeed. Thank you very much. That was excellent. <laughs> so we have set out before us now some of the history and the background <coughs> of the common fisheries policy, also looking forward to what the future might bring. Our second speaker is MEP Richard Corbett, who I'm sure a lot of you here know. He's one of the six MEPs representing Yorkshire and the Humber. Richard was first elected as a Labour MEP in 1996. <laughs> he sits on the Fisheries and Constitutional Affairs Committees. And he is leader of the Labour MPs in Strasbourg. He only came back from Strasbourg last night, didn't you? So uh, thank you very much for being here, Richard Corbett. Thank you. <laughs> Indeed, I, I came back last night on a flight going to Leeds Bradford Airport, which was diverted because of fog to Humberside Airport. So it was very convenient. I just stayed the night, the night here. Uh, that doesn't always happen when planes are delayed or diverted. H.L. Mencken once said, and it's a quote that is often wrongly attributed to Einstein, that for every complex problem, there is a simple answer that is wrong. And my fear is that the simple answer that we are now going to take back control of our own waters, increase our fishing opportunities without further complication is not going to be so easy to negotiate. For two reasons. Uh, mention was made already of the position that the EU 27 are likely to take in the negotiations and say, if you cut our access to your waters, not only will we cut your access to our waters, but we may restrict your access to the single European market in in retaliation, as it were. That could be a problem in the negotiations. It might not be, because this is part of a much wider negotiation where we're trying to secure access for British products to the European markets, despite leaving. And for them to single out one particular product might, in practice, not, not be so easy for them to do, if, if it got to that point. In fact, access to their market is perhaps endangered more in other ways. And let's not forget access to the market remains vital. Nearly 80% of our fish that we catch is exported largely to the rest of the European Union. Um, the fish processing industry 
depends enormously on that. And fish processing, in terms of its contribution to the economy, is, is, is much larger even than what we get directly from fisheries, about five times the size. So being able to continue to export without impediment is vital. But the threat to that comes at the moment, in my view, from the position of our own government, which wants to not just leave the European Union, but exit the European Customs Union as well, the arrangement whereby we don't have customs tariffs at our borders between EU countries. Instead, we have a common external tariff, but internally there are no customs formalities, no tariffs, and no rules of origin checks because we're in the same customs union. If we leave that and it leads to tariffs, it's a big problem. WTO standard tariffs on fisheries products vary, but they, they can be as, as low as 5% for fresh salmon, 25% for processed fish. Um, but even with zero tariffs, if you are outside a customs union, if we manage to negotiate zero tariffs, if you're outside a customs union and exporting into it, you have rules of origin check to check that it's your fish being exported, not something exported via the UK to the EU. This is true for any customs union under WTO rules. I don't need to point out how the problem of not just extra paperwork and red tape but the possibility of hold-up and controls at borders for a fresh product that needs to be fresh is a potential threat. So in my view, leaving the customs union, or not, or not having a customs union with the European Union, at the very least, would be a potential threat. But one can also make a similar argument on the single market. The, the single market is a set of common rules that we have uh, within the European Union rules for the common rules for our common market on consumer rights, um, environmental standards, labelling, health, safety, and so on. If we are going to diverge from the rules that we have agreed over the last 40 odd years with the rest of the European Union on things like phytosanitary standards, packaging, labelling, rules on freshness, rules on transportation, and we have a different set of rules, that will, in due course, entail border checks as well, which could be very damaging for an industry that relies especially on freshness, let alone the extra red tape and the costs to businesses that that entails. Now, those two are self-inflicted um, problems if we leave the European Union and also go ahead with this maximum divergence of leaving the customs union and the single market as well. That's that side of the equation, access to the markets, selling the fish that we catch. Could that be outweighed by the benefits we get from reserving access to our own waters, to our own boats? That's the argument that has been put out there, not least by those who strongly supported leave in the referendum campaign. There my contention is that we could, but it's not going to be so simple, both for legal reasons and for practical reasons. The legal reason is that access to our waters for some third countries in Europe predates the European Union. They are historic agreements which are being revived. The Dutch government has dug out of its archives an agreement from a couple of hundred years ago gives them access to our waters, and they are claiming that this still applies. Now, there's room to contest that legally, but you will see quite a lot of, the, of claims being made that access to, in certain places at least, to some limited access to our waters, from a legal point of view, might still continue. Whether or not that is true, we are still bound, as was mentioned earlier, by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea makes us an independent coastal state with an obligation to manage joint stocks jointly, shared stocks jointly. About a hundred of 
the stocks habitually fished in UK waters are shared with other countries because fish have the unfortunate habit of swimming from one country's waters to another. And you can't put a trunk-like wall down the middle of the North Sea to keep them in our own waters. So those stocks, if we are going to avoid overfishing, have to be managed jointly, like it or not, which means negotiation, negotiation and agreement, which is to agree what we do now. But if we're outside the European Union, we will be facing an agreed position of all the others, rather than us sitting around the table as an equal among, among all the others. Would we do better in such a negotiation? I'm not quite sure that we would work one against the rest when the rest have already got a, uni a united position. Um, the other practical challenges that we'll face if we take full control of our own waters is, it, is also an internal one. Fishing internally is a devolved power. Scotland and Northern Ireland will be running their own fishing policy to a degree though that still has to be argued out. There's a conflict going on at the moment between the central government and the devolved authorities. But there's no doubt that there will be some measure of divergence between what is done in England and what is done in Scotland, let alone Northern Ireland. Um, this too is going to add complexity and complexity to, to, the, to the problem. Whether we stay in or leave the European Union, though, there are issues that are internal to the UK. How we distribute our quota, our share, internally has always, has always been a matter for the UK government. Some of the most contested aspects of that, frequently blamed on Brussels, are actually from a Westminster decision, a uh, Whitehall decision, perhaps more accurately. Um, especially the balance between big, big boats and smaller inshore fishing. But, also the fact that so much of our quota has ended up in the hands of third countries. That is our owners from third countries. That is actually not directly due to the common fisheries policy. That's due to another factor of the European Union, which will be part of the negotiations, which is the so-called right of establishment, the right of an economic <coughs> operator to establish themselves in another EU country irrespective of nationality, set up shop in, in Britain or in France or wherever. In the Brexit negotiations, it's likely, that, so far anyway, that the British government wishes to maintain the right of establishment. So that particular problem will not be resolved through the Brexit negotiations. So all in all, I, I warn again that much of the hoped for benefits of leaving the European Union for the fisheries sector, namely that we would take full control of our own waters and be able to do what we like. I know I'm simplifying slightly the argument, but that was the gist of it. May, in fact, not be so simple. It's, uh, it's full of complexities. It's uh, full of possible countermeasures that would be taken if the negotiations don't go well. And the promises that were made by the Leave campaign are not going to materialize. Brexit will not resemble what was promised. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Bit of a different view there, Richard. Thank you very much. I could see Barry, you were scribbling away there. Barry Deeds uh, is our third speaker. He's been a regular on farming today, <coughs> I have to say which I joined at about the same time you joined the National Federation of Fishermen's Organisations. So um, you have a real insight into the industry as a whole, and I know you talk to a lot of people. You're good at communicating between environmentalists, politicians, and fishermen as well. So Barry is here to give us his views from the National Federation of Fishermen's Organisations. Thank you, and, and thank you for the uh, the invitation. I mean, I, I hadn't heard um, uh, Richard's point about uh, the Dutch finding a, a, a legal argument um, based on historic access going back 
many hundreds of years, which the Dutch herring buses fished off, off um, this coast, the UK coast, um, right back to the late Middle Ages. But if, if it's correct, then that's good news for Holland Grimsby, because that argument would be um, valid, surely, for Iceland. We can go back to Iceland. But um, you let, They'd love to see it. Yeah, well, let, let's, let's see about that one. Um, the referendum in 2016, and actually our, our federation um, took a neutral stance because um, the, view, the view around our table was that fishermen, like everybody else, had a vote, um, and it would be presumptuous, presumptuous of us to, to dictate to them uh, which way uh, they should vote. But I think the feeling is that um, a very, very high percentage of uh, the fishing industry voted um, to leave the EU. And a lot of that was to do with the experience that they have had of the common fisheries policy. And that really started from day one. Uh, for those who aren't acquainted with that particular bit of history, um, the UK, and I, uh, I think it's fair to say the UK was ambushed uh, in 1973 by the existing member states who made uh, on the entry terms to the EEC as it was uh, at that time made uh, the principle of equal access in other words access to UK waters um, the uh, a precondition in other words they wouldn't sign up to the uh, the common market uh, access to the common market um, unless uh, we surrendered our waters um, now that removed at that stage, just as the international, um, international law was changing, as Jill said, to uh, UNCLOS, the United Nations Law of the Sea, um, which established 200 mile limits and gave uh, responsibility for managing marine resources within that uh, exclusive economic zone to the coastal state. So had we not been in the common fisheries policy, we would have been an independent coastal state. And that has cost us uh, very dearly in terms of lost fishing opportunities um, over 45 years uh, that have directly um, and seriously and adversely affected our coastal communities. You look at the ports from not just Hull and Grimsey that were affected by Iceland, uh, but from Lowestoft to the Scottish border, the, the, the south coast, um, and the, uh, the Southwest, uh, I received, all of them have been adversely affected. So the CFP um, took over, and our experience uh, of, of that particular mechanism um, has not been good. Um, it took us in the 90s uh, into a conservation crisis uh, caused by overcapacity. Subsidies were uh, made freely available. You could build a boat with 75% uh, of the finance being available. That led to um, serious overcapacity uh, in the 80s, which led to a conservation crisis in the 90s, which we only really uh, began to get out of in the year 2000. Things have turned around since then. Fish stocks are, are on the build. But it was uh, an extremely painful uh, period for us. So as well as the... Um, <coughs> initial um, disadvantage, built-in disadvantage for the UK um, of access to the EU fleets to our waters uh, was the, uh, the malfunctioning uh, of, of this over-centralized, um, top-down uh, system of management that has repeatedly failed us. The, um, the 19... 83 quotas were introduced um, and shared between the member states in a, in a giant um, horse trading exercise that lasted five years. Um, and, but the important thing is that most of the fish allocated is actually caught in UK waters. The ratio um, of EU fleets, uh, this is in terms of value, what the EU fleets take out of UK waters by comparison with the UK vessels fishing in EU waters is four to one, uh, and that's a, 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 that's a fundamental um, uh, point. Um, in value terms, uh, the, UK take, uh, the EU takes four times as much as, as we take from their waters. If you look at the quotas, some of them are very extreme. Channel cod, I, I, you 
you can just imagine the line going more or less down the middle of the, the channel. Um, the UK share of channel cod is 9%. Um, the French share is 84%. Now that's, when we talk about a need to rebalance the quotas, that's the most extreme example, but there are many others um, not very far away from, from that, that set of figures. The word reci reciprocity was um, used, reciprocal access. And that's a very important uh, word, but I don't think it's always understood. Um, reciprocity is what happens between the EU and Norway at the moment. Um, we have a set of uh, arrangements at the end of uh, negotiations at the end of each year, each autumn. EU and Norway sit down and they agree the total allowable catches on the basis of scientific advice. Um, and then they agree quota shares and, and access arrangements. And the quota shares are based on uh, the science of zonal attachment, it's called essentially what's in your waters and what's in our waters and let's share on that basis. It's got a scientific uh, underpinning with some political um, finessing. Uh, then that balance is finally calibrated, it's finally calculated each year, and it's a 50-50. That is a reciprocal ar arrangement. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. That's reciprocity, not a four-to-one relationship. That is an exploitative relationship. If, if the UK was a West African country, you would say this is a neo-colonial uh, exploitative relationship. Uh, where we are losing out systematically for 40, 45 years with consequences for our coastal communities. Now, um, we are where we are. The referendum um, gives us an opportunity to move away from that. Um, not surprisingly, um, the EU27 are not ha happy about having to give up this asymmetrical um, and ex essentially exploitative relationship um, and has been said already, has spelt out its negotiating position, at least for the transition period, um, it wants status quo on access, status quo on uh, uh, quota shares. The, EU, the UK would play no part in uh, EU decision making, not the European Parliament, not the Council of Ministers, uh, but we would be subject to the rules for the two years, so we'd have no say, we'd be rule takers <coughs> that have no say in the making of the rules, apart from some kind of notional consultation, which is fairly loosely defined. Uh, the UK's desire for a transition period um, and later on a free trade agreement would be used to force the UK um, to agree to those, those terms. But the UK has pushed back. Uh, the Prime Minister said two weeks ago uh, that the UK will be an independent coastal state um, from next March. Um, access to fish in UK waters will be negotiated. Uh, with the EU prior to each December Council. Um, the UK will sit as an independent party in international fishing negotiations. Extremely important for the North Sea when the really important decisions are made uh, in conjunction with Norway. Um, so it's clear that um, fishing is a very high priority um, both for the UK and the EU. Um, the transitional arrangements are imminent, we're expecting a, uh, a, a conclusion or it's anticipated that there may be a conclusion uh, by the European Council on the 23rd of this month, so the decisions are, are imminent. Um, I think that um, fisheries are in many respects a litmus test for Brexit because the, the actual consequences of Brexit on trade will take years if not decades to work out fully. But you will know from day one whether the fishermen are happy or not. And uh, that is why I think uh, fishing has a, a resonance, um, a symbolic significance um, that goes way beyond its economic significance, which is quite small. The parli parliamentary arithmetic um, at the moment gives the government next to no room for manoeuvre uh, in terms of the DUP, the 13 Scottish Conservative uh, MPs and, and, and others in, in Parliament. So the legal position is quite clear. From March next year, we will be an independent coastal state. That gives uh, the UK uh, 
um, an independent seat at the table. Uh, we can negotiate on access. I don't think anybody, uh, uh, anybody that's got any um, grounds in reality expects all non-UK vessels to be expelled uh, from uh, UK waters. What we're talking about is access on our terms, just as happens with Norway. Um, so, um, managing the stocks um, under UNCLOS rules um, in combination with those countries that we share stocks, including the EU and, and Norway, um, is, is, is the future for us. Um, but the, the, quest the question really li now lies with the UK cabinet. You know, will they sell out fishing again as, as happened in 1973? Or do we have the opportunity to move to uh, a, new sit uh, a new situation which we would be an independent coastal state and all that follows from that? Thank you very much, Barry. <clears throat> Just summing up there that uh, there is an opportunity to, to create something new. You want the Norway model? We'll see if it happens. Our final speaker is Martin Boyers. He's the chief executive of Grimsby Fish Market. You can't get much closer to the fishing industry and trade than you can. And Martin was there this morning, as he is every day at the market. He's part of a group as well, appointed by the Minister to consider the 2040 strategic framework and vision for seafood. And his perspective brings into focus the integrated food chain for fish, which means international cooperation and maintaining healthy trading negotiations. So please welcome Martin Boyce. <laughs> Well, thank you for the invitation to speak. I, I wasn't quite sure what I was letting myself in for by attending uh, this, uh, this gathering, this debate. The last debate I actually attended was in the tea shop in our fish market. But um, the, there's an opportunity for us to discuss uh, the way forward. And from a Grimsby perspective, um, I think we need to put it into context about the fish industry. And you just mentioned the fact that uh, the trade and the business that we do. One of the things that affected Grimsby, it's got a great history and, and a lot of people in Grimsby are particularly interested in the history uh, and we look back uh, over 150 years in the Dock Tower and, and all the rest of it. But the thing that significantly changed Grimsby was the Cod Wars of the 70s and the early 80s which decimated the, uh, the fleet in Grimsby. And Grimsby at one time, we have to remember, Grimsby was the largest fishing port in the world uh, and of course it's nothing like that these days. So the fishing fleet was decimated because of the Cod Wars and the restrictions which Barry mentioned and, and, and Richard and so on and so forth. Uh, but the interesting thing about Grimsby is it's shown fantastic resilience to actually survive all that. Uh, and apart from uh, Grimsby being able to maintain its position, we've got to look at what happened to the other ports that were deep water trawler ports, like Hull, which is now closed, there's no fish market there at all. Aberdeen, which is closed, there's no fish market there at all. Uh, and Fleetwood primarily, they, they were the main deep water ports. So Grimsby has been able to go through all these changes and I can't see that anything to do with Brexit is going to be worse than the decimation of the trawler fleet in the 1970s and 80s. So as far as I'm concerned, Brexit is something that we need to deal with and we need to get on with. Uh, and actually as far as business is concerned, we need to understand the rules of engagement and what it means rather than keep uh, pontificating about what might happen. I have to say I'm not a politician and I'm not a diplomat uh, uh, and I'm certainly not an academic as you can tell but I am a business person and I just want to get on with it and I think there's opportunities that may arise out of Brexit and we have to take the best uh, of it um, to make sure that Grimsby survives and what we've also got in Grimsby which apart from the fishing that was decimated in the 70s and 80s we still do have a fleet, it's not as big as it was, and everybody, a lot of people in Grimsby don't think there is a fleet. But just to tell you, Grimsby Fish Market, we landed 12,000 tonnes of fresh fish last year, 2017. We also landed over 3,000 tonnes of shellfish. So Grimsby is an active port. And apart from that, we've got in Grimsby some of the, the best seafood companies and the best processors, not just in the UK, but in Europe. And Grimsby is a hub of activity within the fish industry and will continue. And the thing that makes it continue is the fact that people, consumers, all of, the, all of you people who have taken the time to attend, I presume, are interested in eating fish. So at some point, 
once the, as long as the demand is there, the business will take care of making sure that the fish and the food gets to the customers. Um, and it's always the businesses that create jobs. It's not the politicians and it's not the, it's not the councils, it's the businesses that create the jobs that will create prosperity uh, and income. And what we've seen in Grimsby is, is the ability to actually change the way we operate. And there's been lots of changes. We've adapted to every single rule that's ever come out of Europe since 1973, we've adapted to. Whether we agree with them or not, discard ban for example and all that, we, we cope, we've been able to cope with absolutely everything. So I think Grimsby is well placed to be able to deal with all of, its, uh, all of the issues around the common fishing policy and what, what it is now and what might happen post Brexit. And it was mentioned earlier on that it's, it's complicated. I think it's actually more complex than that. It gets very complicated. And also what happens within the fish industry itself and representing the, the British Ports Association as I do, it actually becomes very divisive because within this structure of the fish industry, everybody's got their own view because what we've got in the fish industry is a whole sequence of buyers and sellers all the way through the chain. So somebody catching the fish will, will sell it to somebody who on the market will buy it, who will then sell it to a processor, who will then who will buy it and he'll sell it to a retailer and they'll sell it to somebody else. So there's all this chain. So you're never going to please all the people all the time. So whatever comes out of the fisheries debate and whatever comes out of the negotiations, there will be winners and losers within the fish industry. There's no doubt about it. And in this town, we have a, a great capacity with businesses that import frozen fish. And so the frozen fish business, I don't know what the statistic is. Um, Jill, you put some up that probably from a couple of years ago. But there's a huge amount of fish that comes into this town and it creates a lot of jobs, four and a half to 5,000 jobs connected to fish and fish processing around the area. So we've got some very good uh, uh, jobs and businesses. Why are those jobs and businesses in Grimsby? Because historically, this was a big fishing port. And also what we've got here is a good network of distribution. Uh, we've got curing, fish smoking, we've got smokehouses, we've got coal stores, and also we've got labor and we've got skills. So Grimsby is actually well placed to withstand any of the detail or any of the problems that arise from the complexities of sorting out the politics of, of, uh, of coming out of Europe. And whilst I think, yeah, it, I don't think at the time necessarily people knew what they were voting for, but as Barry said, we are where we are. And from a business point of view, I think that Grimsby is well placed. I think we can diversify, we can change, we can adapt and we'll move on as long as there's a demand from consumers to eat fish. And as you mentioned, I was involved in the, uh, Mr Eustace, the fisheries minister, put together a team to develop a 2040 strategy. That's a long-term strategy. So the Minister of State doesn't think that the fish industry is going to come to an end. And I'll tell you all here, the fish industry won't come to an end because whatever happens, we'll just carry on. So we'll get past it and we'll get through it. We, we need to understand what the rules of engagement are. And that's the difficult part about Brexit. And it is complicated because of those things to do with at sea and regulations and catching and uh, reciprocal arrangements, flag boats, and, and Barry has been doing it for years and Richard uh, looked into it. But looking at it, uh, trying to look at it uh, from a simplistic point of view of just being in Grimsby and just the business, whilst we've, we're going to have challenges, of course we are, but I think the, the people in Grimsby uh, and the businesses in Grimsby are well placed to overcome that. And we also have to remember that the fish industry structure is not quite what people think it is because the fish we eat, the bulk of the fish we eat is imported. And where does that mainly come from? Iceland and Norway. And the bulk of what we catch, which are the nephrops and the prawns and the scallops and, and, the, and the best stuff, the brill, the turbot and all that stuff, is exported. But the fishermen around the coast do a, do a fabulous job. Uh, and it's very important that we do look after them. And one of the issues about fisheries, which is always an interesting point and was brought up at the time when the debate was on about leaving the EU, is the, the economy. And it was mentioned about figures and, and however many millions it is. But it actually only represents 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 of GDP. So economically, fisheries is very low on the radar. But emotionally, emotionally, it's at the top of the tree. And it's things like the RNLI and the programmes are on the telly and the fishermen. And it's, oh, what about the fishermen? So emotionally, fishermen carry a lot of weight. Yet statistically, most of the fish we eat is imported. So there's a little bit of a dichotomy, which sometimes is, is difficult to, to deal with. 
And that's why you can't please all the people all the time. But in Grimsby, we're relying on Icelandic fish, so we want free trade. We want to continue with the trade. It's also important to recognise that our, our, our colleagues in Iceland, and I know many of them personally, they want to sell us fish just as much as we want to receive it. And the same with the French and the Spanish that are fishing up on the west coast. Uh, they want to keep coming and they want to buy our fish as well. So there, there must be a will there to continue. The issue is going to be the politics about it. And I think, like me, uh, I'm fed up of listening about it, I'm fed up of pontificating about it, I'm fed up of speculating about it, and it's about time everybody and the politicians, not Richard or, or Austin, but the politicians need to get on with it and deal with it because we're all fed up of listening about it. Thank you. Thank you. very much indeed for bringing a bit of uh, some home truths there. Um, before we open up to the floor, I just want to ask each of you, uh, we've had a little bit from Barry about this, what would be your perfect world for UK fishing after the transition? So how would you like it to look? What do you think would be the, the, you know, the best arrangement? Would it be just shutting everyone else out, keeping the fish for ourselves, that's it, it's all ours, yes we'll make a lot of money, or is it, does it have to be trade, we open up, let some people in, not everyone, manage it carefully, keep the stocks up. What, what's your picture for the future? Barry, the perfect picture. The, the perfect picture um, is the UK is an independent coastal state. Um, the, the Norway model, really. Um, not everything that Norway does is relevant to us or would work, but it's the fact that they are an independent coastal state. They control uh, their fisheries. They work with those countries that they share stocks, including Russia and the Faroes, Iceland, you, uh, the EU. So do they decide everything that they do, or do they have to give with joint well. stocks, it's it, it's it, it's negotiation. These autumn negotiations, annual autumn negotiations, so are the mechanisms. On a level playing. On a, on a, uh, with the UK there as an as an independent, um, and everything else flows from that. Um, rebalancing quotas flows from that, um, and I would also put on my list unimpeded trade. I don't think it's anybody's interest um, to have obstacles to trade. The obstacles come from the politics. So that would be good for you, Martin, wouldn't it? Free trade, but well, us deciding, you know. The trade, trade, trade reciprocal. Uh, we're importing, we're exporting, we're dealing with Iceland, we're buying off them, we're exporting to France and to Spain. Uh, there's, there's business within the UK where there's a huge demand for fish. And we're all, we've got, we must remember as well that we've got a, a great product, fish. It's a great protein, people like to eat it, it's quite expensive now, uh, it can only grow. It's been recommended by the, the health authorities to eat, you know, should try and eat two a week. That was the point of the Seafood 2040 document, to try and get, eat, more, eat more fish. So everything's in the, in the right place. It's just the mechanics of making that work. And trade and business is how it will work. And historically, people have got on with it, particularly in Grimsby. Some fantastic, I mean, Ross Fish, Carl Ross and what he did in that empire. Uh, I mean, it's incredible what people did and what people achieved. Um, so I think that will continue. So Richard, do you think the politicians will allow that to happen? Okay, the question. Yes, but the, the, the ideal you are asking for, the ideal is that we can increase our share of the catch for British fishers and we can still export without any problem um, to the rest of Europe. My contention is that it ain't going to be so simple. Um, sadly, now you mentioned Norway as being an example, but Norway has to negotiate as well, just like the rest of us. Norway, by the way, outside the EU, has seen a bigger fall in the number of, in the size of its fishing fleet than Britain inside the EU, which is, it shows that it's not nirvana out there when you leave, and you'll have to negotiate from outside. Um, Norway doesn't always get the deal it wants in such negotiations. And above all, we'll be, after all, still applying the same basic concept. Under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, we have to aim at maximum sustainable yield, yes, which is now what the, the reformed common fishing policy. Remember, it was reformed three years ago. We needed it. 
mentioned badly, uh, they are based on the same principles, the idea that we can unilaterally increase our take of shared stocks without agreement. You know, the Faroe Islands tried that a few years ago. They, they, they got massive retaliation. It wasn't good for stocks either. You have to negotiate to agree. My contention is that's going to be not easier from outside. And Dr. Wakefield, of course, the lawyers are always involved in all negotiations, aren't they? <laughs> well, they are, but uh, I think that uh, this isn't really a legal point. I think that more attention ought to be given to sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, the, and there are ways, I mean, we are where we are now. There are ways that that can be done. So we, if we go, and this government is talking about giving more attention to the environment. So those environmental protection principles could be um, given higher priority in any policy that do, we devise. And we need to look to the future, which is uh, the blue growth economy. And the EU has one, but fisheries, marine fisheries are not on that agenda. They're excluded from it. Aquaculture is there. And we'd need to ask why. And the reason is that our baseline diminishes the whole time. So we talk about recovered stock, but those stocks have sunk so low over the years that we're just talking about small improvements and not the, um, the uh, abundance that we used to have and the resilience that more abundant seas would have to the challenges that we're going to have in the future, such as from climate change. I thought fish stocks had improved. They have they gradually, have. but that's They're from a very low baseline, a very right. low baseline. You'd need to read, well, you could look at Callum Roberts' book on uh, diminished stocks from the start of the 20th century when there was huge abundance, but it's been overexploited. exploited uh, Grimsby got rich on, you know, the exploitation of the seas, and, you know, it's a great tragedy that it's fishing industry is diminished. It shouldn't be. Well, just one short point from Barry before we ask. I, I did say that there was a crisis in the 1990s from, but if you look at the IC science, that's the authoritative science, there was a turning point at year, the year 2000. And for all of the main species groups, there's a dramatic reduction in fishing uh, mortality. In other words, fishing pressure. And what you have from that point is stocks coming back up. And some of them uh, are faster than others. Uh, North Sea Place, um, a million tons, uh, just short of a million tons, uh, total allowable catch. Hake is another one that's just rocketed up. They're all, all of the, uh, I think um, the main, uh, the chairman of the scientific committee, Esko Kierkegaard, uh, says something like all of the main commercial stocks are on track to meet maximum sustainable yield. Some of them are, are moving faster than others. But we, we did the hard work way, way before the CFP reform in 2013. The turning point was in the 90s. And the point that's made about um, the fact that there are fewer fishermen in um, Norway is quite correct. At the end of the Second World War, there was something like 90,000 fishermen in Norway. Now there are 9,000 fishermen. That was part of addressing this overcapacity mm -hmm. issue. They did it, we, we did it, it was very painful, but the stocks are coming back up. So it's a misleading picture, or it's a very out of date picture to say that the stocks are depleted. Okay, let's take some questions from the floor then. Please put your hand up if you've got a, a question to ask. Let's turn to Austin Mitchell first of all. Now we've got a microphone coming your way. <laughs> Got, um, Elizabeth's got a microphone for you. Just make sure you hold it nice and close, otherwise we won't be able to hear. Austin Mitchell, former Member of Parliament for uh, Gretchen. I think we should divest ourselves of any arguments about for and against Brexit, because this is a question of how we manage our fishing stocks rather than whether we leave or don't. Put that question aside. I think the, uh, Dr. Wickfield told us the correct position. If we leave the European regulations which have imposed the common fisheries policy for, and we then come back under the uh, Territorial Limits Act of 1976, which we passed exempting European vessels. Uh, so we could decide whether we admit people to British waters uh, or not. Uh, and it's nothing to do with the single market uh, or the customs union because uh, they deal in fish products, not the catching of fish. Catching of fish is up to us, for us to control. Now, access and the common fishes that have been 
a bad policy which have led to a disastrous all of fishing, uh, unsustainable fishing, because it's a political process. It's got to share out catches between several nations rather than give primacy to the nation state. And the nation state has the best interest, their only real interest, in providing sustainable fishing so they can hand the industry and the stocks onto future generations. That's not the interest of other people. It's our interest as a nation, and that's why Iceland and Norway and the Faroes and uh, New Zealand and America and Canada, I don't want to go through the list of where you're so successful. So the problem we face now uh, is what access we should give, uh, and to what extent the government regards the interest of fishing as expendable, as they did in 1972, uh, to uh, Secure some uh, negotiated agreement with, uh, with uh, Europe. My view uh, would be uh, that we take back control and give historic rights as much precedence as Iceland gave Britain's historic rights uh, in 1976. But that's, a, that's a, a, a personal view. I think it's clear that unless we take control and manage our own stocks uh, and control them from London or Edinburgh rather than Brussels. Uh, then uh, there's not going to be a rebuilding of the fishing industry uh, to make it a viable way of life for coastal communities like ours. Uh, and I think the key to that is investment. We aren't going to get investment in the fishing industry unless they have certainty. We haven't got certainty unless we control our own waters. I think that's the point. So my question really, <laughs> just got to a question, yeah. <laughs> politicians are usually just a rhyme. Stop it. The question really is, to what extent is fishing expendable? Right, so is fishing going to be used as a pawn, I could say pawn, as a pawn in trade negotiations? Um, could you be sold down the river? What do you think, Richard? Well, you mentioned that in 1973, the, the then Conservative government, when we entered, sold fishing down the river. Um, I wouldn't say I was confident that they wouldn't do the same thing again. But in any case, um, as the discussion has shown up, the key thing for the future of the fishing industry is sustainability. If there's no fish left, there will be no fishers and there will be no fishing industry. But Sustainability then on a, on a trade is the key. Agreement, but, on a trade mm, agreement, mm, it could I'll, be, I'll come, couldn't it, that it's mm. used as, as something to bargain for, as a bargaining yeah. chip? Well, I'll come to that. But the, the first thing is sustainability. You can't do that unilaterally. You can't just set your own share without reference, without negotiating with other countries. Because if everybody does that, whether you're in or out of the EU, you have to negotiate, as Norway does with the EU. I'm not sure we'll be in a better position. But secondly, yes, selling is as important as catching, or arguably more important. As you said, the, the, the fish processing industry here is, is five times bigger than the catching industry in economic, in economic value. So it's important that we can still sell our fish. For that, our main export market, when we sell 80% of our fish, is the rest of the European Union. So we've got to get that right. And then on the, the different rules on, that we're going to follow, if, they are, if the EU and us are together following the IC's recommendations on sustainability, we're not going to be actually diverging very much on the catching on the catching rules. And by the way, the discard ban, because I know that's not very popular with many fishermen, the discard ban brought in by the European Union, it was the British government that pushed for it. It was in the Conservative Party manifesto. So I don't think they're going to do anything different uh, there was if we're outside, if we're outside the there EU. Was and there was pressure. indeed public pressure for it. And I don't see that suddenly being changed either if we leave. Okay, Barry. Um, Are you, do, you really, do you think fishing will be used as a, as a negotiating chip? Or? This is the $64,000 question. Um, because we, we are back in, in the situation where uh, there's a choice, and that choice lies with the British government. Um, uh, what priority is going to be given to fishing um, uh, against the EU's um, negotiating guidelines, which are quite clear and you know, quite brutal? Um, they want the status quo. Um, 
On the other hand, the parliamentary arithmetic, I think, makes it very difficult for the government not to respect the fishing issue. And also, as Martin said, you know, there is an emotional attachment mm. to fishing, isn't there? Um, Michael Gove has a high profile. He is the person who deals with fishing. He is the person who would be you know, partaking in the negotiations or feeding into the ear of David Davis. And do you feel then that fishing has a profile that means that it will be considered significantly within trade negotiations coming up to Going on the Prime Minister's words of a fortnight ago, yes, it, the UK will be an independent coastal state from March 2019. We are looking to rebalance the quotas. Um, that We couldn't have wished for, for better. We, we had a meeting with uh, Michael Gove on Tuesday. Uh, he reaffirmed, reaffirmed his, his, his view did point out that there are other ministries, economic ministries within the UK that have the, their own interests and will be pressing those, of course. Number 10, the Cabinet Office and DEXU, the Department for Exit, the EU, have to coordinate this. But just looking at the parliamentary arithmetic and this uh, emotional attachment that Martin referred to, um, I, I find it very difficult um, to believe that the, uh, the government could come back and say, well, we've sold out the, the, uh, the fishing industry, but look, it's all right on trade, we've got what we... Mm. I don't so think... you don't think it will happen? I don't... How about you, Martin? Well, I definitely don't think that will happen. I think there's an opportunity uh, within the structure of uh, fisheries and the negotiations to use it uh, uh, actually to our benefit and to our favour. It's one of the things that Austin was alluding to about the all the catches. It's fundamental that science is involved. Uh, we've got a shared resource. Um, the the ICs that uh, Barry referred to is, is an international organisation looking at it, so we can agree with that. Uh, and Richard made the point: the fish don't know the bound. There's no boundaries. There's no fence in the in the North Sea. So, you, and you can't catch to order. So we might as well talk about it with our colleagues. And, you, and, and emphasize our position and use that as a bargaining tool to get a better deal. And because of what I said earlier about the, the emotion and the, versus the economics of it, there's no way that we will use the fishery as, as being expendable, but it, because of the uh, emotion of it is, is massive. Yes, it is. As we saw with the discards, with Fernley Whitting stalls and everyone you know, doing that. Any, let's have another question. Gentleman here with the glasses. Uh, and then afterwards, the gentleman behind, the one in front, the person, in front, and then afterwards, the person behind. Could well, you just say who you are, first of all? And, yeah. Of course, my name is Richard Barnes. I'm a professor of law at the University of Hull. Too many lawyers in the room, possibly. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the, the presentation. Um, fisheries are common pool resource, and what that means in practice is they're incredibly difficult to manage. But what everybody agrees is that management of them then requires cooperation. So the, the real focus here has got to be on cooperation. Now the challenge for fisheries post-Brexit is that that cooperative framework is no longer restricted to fisheries. It's caught up in a more complex picture about market access and a wider range of economic issues. Now what's interesting is I think that everybody in the panel agrees here that it's highly desirable to have as open a trading agreement as possible with the EU to reduce any barriers to trade because that will harm every area of the economy. So the question then is, if we accept that, how do we deal with the particular problem of fisheries? And what kind of compromises will result through this process of negotiation and cooperation? And I'd be very interested to hear from the panel what they think that kind of future is going to look like. Fabulous question, Anna, about what the vision is for the perfect future. But we need to think about what that's going to look like, particularly in the catch sector. So where do you see that, that kind of cooperative framework producing potential changes in, for example, the allocation of fisheries? Will it be, for example, greater control over the inshore fisheries to benefit the small scale and smaller fishers? Do we see particular um, stocks being targeted? For example, would we like to see a greater share of two or three key stocks like HIC? So, yeah, my question is, where do you see that, 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 that future for fisheries? Thank you very much indeed. Great question. A little bit of detail then on how we actually see this working. What do we give up? What do we allow? How much cooperation? Dr Wakefield, have you got any ideas on how, 
how that might work? Well, we're not going to be in the common fisheries policy because we've been told we're not going to be in the common fisheries policy. And so the question then is how much we diverge away from that, um, given that the, the government thereafter can say that we're not, not subject to EU control. I don't think that there will be very much divergence. The UK government could do something that was quite radical, quite different. It could um, adopt, uh, uh, put a greater, and Gove has said he wants to put greater emphasis on uh, environmental factors. So he could introduce an environmental uh, principle, the user pays principle, so that we don't actually care who's taking the fish out of, the, um, out of our waters, because um, a lot of the quota is foreign owned anyway but those people are actually paying to uh, take that, and that is then applied, it could be hypothecated to be applied to coastal communities. So there are things that our government so could do. Paying to, pay to catch pay, the fish, pay to that catch the fish. That's a public resource, and they could be made to pay for it. It's the only sector that does not pay for the use of its resource, and it's owned by the public, so we have a right to a say in how that resource is used and where the monies from that go to. Some people have made very, uh, have become very rich on the back of fishing and we've got, post, we've got coastal communities that have been decimated and the destruction of the artisanal sector. But our own government is implicated in that for the way, the way in which it allocates quota and that needs to change. How many of you like the sound of that idea? You know, charging people to come in and, and, and fish and you get the money? For these coastal communities along here. Doesn't sound bad, does it? Right, okay. Barry? Um, uh, we are talking about uh, shared stocks. Um, it's sensible as well as a legal requirement to manage those stocks cooperatively. Um, I think that there's a huge area between um, EU. UK um, and Norway as our major partner in the North Sea, um, where there would be agreement, um, a science-based uh, approach to setting quotas. Um, maximum sustainable yield, I know there's argu different arguments about how you interpret that, uh, especially in the context of mixed fisheries. Is that how much the stocks could manage? Yeah, how, how, how much it's safe and to take out each year without damaging the... Uh, whilst maintaining yeah. the maximum long-term yields. Um, a, a discard policy, um, I don't like the EU uh, land is obligation. I think it's a very bad uh, piece of legislation. But the principle of, of uh, systematically reducing discards, I think, is a sound one and ought to be at the heart of fisheries uh, policy. What, what, so all of that is agreed area, I think. I don't think there's any controversy around that. Um, I, I think the issue is where those decisions are made. At the moment, they're made... Um, well, this is an interesting point. Um, theoretically, uh, for the EU, they're made um, in the Council of Ministers, taking into account uh, regulations that have been agreed with the European Parliament, the, the kind of framework. But actually, when you look at the, the decisions on quotas, the total allowable catches in the North Sea for the joint stocks, they're made in EU-Norway. They're made already bilateral, in bilateral negotiations. And then, although these are called consultations, um, once there's an agreed record, that goes up to the Norwegian minister for adoption, uh, and it goes to the Council of Ministers for rubber stamping. I, I can only remember one year in which a, 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 a small amount of tinkering was done. So the, for the North Sea, the major decisions are already made in these bilateral negotiations. The difference would be that the UK uh, would be there as an independent party, as a third party, which, which is in line with its, its legal status. And the, um, the slide that Jill put up about the UK's fisheries limits, um, you can see it's a very large area. Uh, what is left in the North Sea is something like 20% is left for the EU. Um, the rest is uh, UK and Norway. Um, in those situations, it's completely, uh, completely untenable uh, for us to be subject to the EU, to be only one voice. It, 
uh, amongst... It's to be an independent coastal state That's deciding our own, yeah. our own policy. Uh, cooperation is given. Has to, there has to be cooperation on setting harvesting. But I think there's a much larger area of fisheries policy that, that there's, no, there's no great controversy over. But just to be clear, you don't want to close down the trade and the, and the, as our question was saying, you know, it would be very damaging, wouldn't it, to not have open trade? Absolutely, and I think it's important to remember that there are hundreds of businesses uh, in the EU that are dependent on supply uh, from this country, um, and their voice doesn't get heard very often. But that's a, that's a big, big factor. Um, so yes, unimpeded trade works, works for us. Um, well, I think the, uh, the whole position uh, is interesting because the, there has to be cooperation, uh, there's no doubt about that. And this issue about uh, quota uh, and the common fishing policy, I can't see any circumstance now in which DEFRA can possibly rewrite the common fishing policy, which means they'll probably adapt most of what's in place, which will, will, some people might agree with or not. But, because the time, the, the clock's ticking, uh, and, and it is a complex piece of work. Um, and it's a fair point that Richard makes about fishing being caught up in other politics, because I'm sure it could sort itself out. And we need to be able to maintain dialogue with our, uh, our European colleagues, because it is a shared resource, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and the point about quotas is that originally, when the work, going back to the good old days, and people talk about it, it actually was a free-for-all, it wasn't good old days, uh, and then we, through the, through the common fishing policy, they created quota, and that was based on track record. So you had to prove you'd caught the fish, and then you were allocated quota. But now, quota is a traded commodity. So there is value to it. So there, it, many fishermen would argue they've paid for that, so they wouldn't want to be paying any more money. Uh, and the other problem with having quota that's been paid for is that if they change that system and introduce more quota, it dilutes the existing quota and therefore the value. And in many cases, and particularly up in Scotland, a lot of the fishermen have used quota value as, as collateral, yeah. you know, as collateral yeah. to buy boats mm -hmm. and a part of the pension pot. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Richard, just briefly. Yep. The problem with being a third country like Norway, you don't have a minister around the table at the EU Council of Ministers nor MEPs in the European Parliament. That's why. I get Norwegian ministers coming to see me, Norwegian diplomats and so on, saying, oh, by the way, this thing's coming up uh, in the European Union. Could you, could you take account of this, please? Could you take account of that, please? They're not represented directly. They, they are at so a disadvantage. So we'd have to do that. And if we're outside, we'd... we'd we're outside, we'd have the, to the, lobby. The thing is, we're the on trade, position. but not... And on the... I mean, all this depends on what, what is negotiated. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, and I don't have confidence in the government. Philip Hammond has already said it's more important for us to get access for our financial sector to the European market than, than the issue of uh, than the fisheries issue. He's already said that's more important to him. And uh, we saw what happened in 1973. So then the question, which we will face at some point in nine months' time, what if they come back with a bad deal? What if it's a deal that doesn't reduce access to, <laughs> to our waters, but endangers, because we're outside the customs, you have <coughs> our choice, not theirs, endangers our ability to sell our fish in Europe. What do we do if it's a bad deal? Well, David Davis, of course, famously said, the Secretary of State for Brexit famously said, if a democracy cannot change its mind, it ceases to be a democracy. And I'd rather see no Brexit than a bad Brexit. Right, okay. Uh, gentleman who we were going to call on for, if you could yeah. wait for the microphone. I'd like Thank to ask you a uh, question. Could you just tell us who you are first? Uh, it's uh, Alan Fairfield. Uh, it's in regard to fishing. Uh, I've lived in the town all my life, and I did see in the 60s, I worked on the docks, the amount of fish that went to fish meal, mm. good uh, mm. uh, uh, fish, that, uh, because there was uh, just overloaded it. Uh, because they're too much. I know we're not in that situation now, but I do think uh, conservation is important um, for, and we should have rules and, and regulations uh, and we need to work together with other nations and I think that we've had a, a long period of peace 
uh, being, I can remember as a child in the war time and the war, I never want to see that again. Uh, it didn't affect Grimsby too badly, but we were bombed and in England and the whole got it terrible. I don't want to see that again. And uh, I don't think anybody does. But uh, we've got to have agreements between nations. And uh, I think the EU is a good organisation, although we had EFTA. We formed EFTA after de Gaulle wouldn't allow us in, yeah. EU. And we had eight nations in EFTA. Uh, we had more than the EU, they had six, but they were uh, considerable at six. But uh, so uh, what I'm asking is the possibility of reviews there's a lot of the other countries in the EU are concerned about various items uh, of how it is operating and the parliament should be stronger and uh, uh, I wonder what possibility there is to do and now we're having this serious negotiation because it's definitely going to be serious if we completely pull out and I wonder whether we can get better terms by negotiating together and a review, because we are an important nation within the EU, uh, uh, possibilities of a review and serious, uh, not just walking out, but getting down on the table. <coughs> George, you're okay. not war, war. war. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So, serious negotiations and, and uh, uh, a lot of give and take. I think actually one point that you mentioned there about um, sustainability is quite important, uh, which we might come on to, um, about natural capital and uh, Michael Gove, you know, saying, saying that actually protection of wildlife and conservation could be part of um, paying fishermen and farmers some subsidy back by, because they're conserving stocks, which I think would be possibly part of negotiations. Let's have another a question. Thank you. Uh, sorry, gentleman there behind you. Good uh, afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to raise the question. Firstly, the questioners seem to be Could adopting a linear, a linear approach there. Could you tell us your name? Thank My you. name's Mark Warburton. Among other things, I'm a director of a company called Oceanic Seafoods Limited, um, a global trader of, of fish. Um, firstly, I'd just like to echo some of the words of Martin just to confirm that fish like copper and coffee is a global commodity and is traded on a global basis. Um, secondly, I voted to remain marginally, but I embrace and look forward to the opportunities that leaving the EU now gives us. The simple question, and it's a personal one really, is that I'd just like to ask each of the panel members with a yes or no answer whether they accept that we are leaving the European Union. <laughs> okay, right, that's, that's told you. It's a simple yes or no, do you accept we are leaving the European Union? Dr. Wakefield. Unfortunately, yes. Um, oh, that was two words. <laughs> Barry. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a Democrat um, and there was a, there was a decision. And um, yeah, that's it. Richard? No, until we know what the deal actually is and see that it's actually good for Britain, we should keep our options open. Right. Well, I think what people voted for and how they vote might be disappointing, but we're in a democracy and that's what stands. And democracy can change their mind. The vote, the vote here actually was, was significant, wasn't it? Um, Boston 75.6, that was the highest percentage area for leave in the UK. North East Lincolnshire 69.9%, East Lindsay 70.7%, North Lincolnshire 66.3%, West Lindsay 61.8%, Lincoln 56.9%. So um, a significant number of people voted to leave. Let's have another question from the gentleman in the front here. Thank you very much indeed. If you could just give us your name. Thank you. Councillor Matthew Brown, uh, Croft Baker Ward Council on North East Lincoln Council. Obviously Great Grimsby is well known for processing fish, not just the catching. And my concern for the people who work in this area and invest in this area is the impact on trade tariffs that could have. 
And as Richard has already stated, that he has people coming from Norway to ask him for help. How can we ensure that we get a fair deal when it comes to trading that will safeguard our processing jobs as well as our actual fishing jobs? Thank you very much indeed. Morton, would you like to start on that? Uh, well. I don't think tariffs would be welcome, but if we do get tariffs, the first thing you need to know is how much is the tariff. Uh, the second thing is you need to know is that it'll get passed on. We're all running businesses. That's no different than uh, the imposition of, of business rates or tax or VAT or anything else. It's part of the cost of running the business and creating a product. So uh, what that would mean indirectly is that the cost of fish would go up. I was just going to ask you, so consumers here would be paying more, yeah. we'd all and, be paying more. And, and then what we find is there's the balance between, you know, uh, the, the, there's a sort of a break and accelerator with price. Uh, and at some price, you know, at a certain price it will sell well, and at a bigger price it will it will not sell so well. So what that would create is a, is a, a price barrier. Uh, and that well, would be I find, the thing. I think fish is really expensive. It is yeah, retail, think, it is, it? yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, and again, I'm a mum, I buy fish, I find it really, really expensive to buy, I have to. Well, again, we've yeah. got to think there's, uh, I don't know, there's something like 10,000 fish and chip shops in the UK. They all sell either cod or haddock. Uh, you know, when it, on average, the average price of fish and chips apparently is, is just below £5 a, a portion yeah. um, if people like eating it. Now, it's quite possible that if there's a tariff, um, that that's got to be passed on. But also, the, the fish and chip shop man has got to pay his staff, there's minimum wage, he's got to pay all his dues, they've got to pay the fat, they've got to pay for the shop rates, they've got to put, they've got to, so that's life. So all we've got to do is deal with it, not worry about it, Just we've just got to deal with it, whatever comes up. Barry, I want to know, how do fishermen look on tariffs? You know, does it actually make a difference Does what do you go and catch? You know, does it change what they decide to catch or how they get quotas or how, how much difference does it make? Some of the figures Dr Wakefield said were, were quite significant. Barry, first of all. We, we, we call it the fishing industry, but actually there are lots of different industries, different sectors. Um, if you start first with the, the big pelagic, that's a herring and mackerel, the, 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 the great big um, shoaling fish that are landed, a lot of that goes to uh, West Africa, um, China, uh, so they're not too bothered about the relationship with the EU. Um, shellfish, on the other hand, crab, lobster, um, nephrops, prawns, uh, whelks, uh, 86 percent dependence on the UK market, uh, on the EU market, so uh, a, you know, a lot of concern there. So we uh, sell 86% of, mm -hmm. of those into yeah, the EU. Yeah. Uh, Ma Martin pointed out earlier, we, 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 um, we, we sell what uh, we um, import what we eat and we export what we catch, and that's the basic relationship for some reason. Uh, so uh, and white fish would be somewhere in the middle uh, uh, with some dependence on, on and you know, the extent to which um, those products are, um, could be substituted um, if, if, if the tariff regime uh, priced them out. Um, and of course with, um, with, with a perishable commodity, um, especially if you think of live crab being exported into France and Spain, uh, uh, non-tariff barriers and pediments at, at the borders are uh, ab absolutely, absolutely a genuine, uh, yes, genuine sir, concern. Yeah. Mm. Well, Dr. Wakefield, the, the figures, just remind us of the, the, the figures. That, well, um, the, the, the figures, the, 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 without a free trade agreement, then we have to pay WTO um, tariffs, and this is a, a, the most favoured nation um, level, which are high. Um, until we have a free trade agreement, those tariffs cannot come down. We're bound by international law. And as I've said, those tariffs, they're up to 23, some cases 25%. So this obviously is going to uh, impact on the sector. So um, what Richard said is right. You know, so this is, um, we need to think carefully about the um, deal that we're getting post-Brexit. We don't actually know what that is. And although we have had a referendum and a majority voted, a very significant minority, almost half, voted to remain. And so I think that the deal that we do get 
ought to be put back to the people because we, I don't think anyone voted to um, have industries that are going to be tied down and unable to operate effectively for the public good, you know, for the country's interest, if they're subject to enormously high tariffs that they weren't previously subject okay. to. Okay, thank you very much. Let's have uh, a couple more questions from the floor. Gentleman here at the front. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Could you give us yeah, your name? For, uh, well, Can you hold the microphone nice? Like you're right. singing. There we yeah. go. <laughs> um, you mentioned that we'll be leaving the CFT shortly. Um, can you explain to me how Austria and Switzerland have a say so on the uh, CFT? Switzerland doesn't have a fishing fleet. Thank you. They've got lakes. Oh. <laughs> There's something I'm just curious about. Why yeah. they don't have any say, any input into something like this, and then we're not going to have one. Let's ask Richard. Well, Switzerland doesn't because it's not in the European Union. Um, Austria and the other countries without a coast line, like, like Hungary, Czech Republic and so on, in the EU Council, frankly, they leave it to the coastal states to, to sort out, especially since the recent reform of the common fisheries policy, which um, to a degree decentralizes and lets the countries around the North Sea reach agreements on the North Sea, the countries around the Mediterranean reach agreements on the Mediterranean and, and, and endorses them at the EU level, on, at least on some issues. But the, the countries that don't have a skin in the game really don't, um, don't take a key role in those negotiations. Okay. Let's have uh, another question. Lady here at the front, thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Natalie Todd. Uh, I'm local, but I work in Brussels for an, an EU media. All right. Okay. And we cover Brexit in the UK. Um, I've been very struck by the um, the emphasis on cooperation. It's been a very informative and measured discussion. Um, but I also remember the Cod Wars, and I'm wondering what will be our strength and our negotiating cards um, when we're outside the, the CFP, and are we risking potentially? heading back towards the Cod Wars. Okay. Well, thank you very much. In fact, there was a question, um, there were questions in uh, the law, um, House of the Parliament, I think, about uh, asking about patrols, naval patrols, and protecting our, our shores um, in relation to this. Um, is it going to get nasty? What do you think, Richard? I mean... Who knows? I hope, I hope not. I very much hope for it. Because the Cod Wars were, were very serious, weren't they? Yes, no, that was a long time ago. Things have moved on. There are more international level agreements now than there were at that point. There's more scientific understanding now than there was at that point. And one hopes that countries are mature enough to sit around the table and reach an agreement. But from time to time, they're not. Um, there was a minor little conflict with, not involving gunboats, fortunately, but sanctions to a degree with the Faroe Islands only a few years ago when they unilaterally set higher quotas without agreeing with other countries. So it can happen again. Barry, what do your fishermen think? I mean, the, the people argy-barging, you know, do they get angry out there on, on the sea? Um, the, the, there's a range of opinion about uh, the degree of access that should be given to non-UK uh, vessels to fish in UK waters after Brexit. Um, at one end of the continuum, uh, all foreign vessels should be excluded. Um, at the other end of the continuum, there should be a negotiation. Um, there should certainly be access for, for uh, a level uh, of non-UK fishing in UK waters. Um, but you would need to have a kind of trade-off on the quota shares, beginning with some particular species that we're, we, we've got problem, problems with especially in the context of, uh, of the landings obligation. Um, I think we have come a, a long way. I think um, cooperation, uh, collaboration is, is hardwired into uh, the system that it, it is very much science-based and uh, all the parties agree to that. But when you're talking about people out fishing, it's big business, isn't it? There's quite a lot at stake. It's, bus it's big business and it's small business. You know, there's a huge range of, uh, of vessels. I think one, you know, in terms of the technical capacity to uh, control uh, and enforce, uh, monitor our own fisheries, uh, we already do that. I mean, it, it's a member state responsibility. So the, the, you're not starting from zero. 
And you, you know, you would have to say that Iceland, with a population of what 350,000 people, uh, seemed to manage their 200 mile limit. Why wouldn't the UK, with a population of 65 million, be unable to do it? How how would you manage that though? Would you have to have patrols? Would the fishing industry, UK? have to set up its own patrols. You couldn't rely on the Royal Navy. All, all, ves to all vessels out over 12 metres now have to have satellite monitoring equipment. So uh, you're not wandering around the North Sea in a patrol vessel looking for somebody. You know where everybody is. Uh, you've got their record. It's a risk-based um, enforcement policy, um, which I, 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 I'm not saying there's no problems, but I think it's entirely doable. And one last question. Uh, we're just coming up to half past 12. Yes, the gentleman over here. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Stephen Harness. I am actually a local councillor, although that's not really relevant um, in, this, in this debate. Although I do sit on the inshore, North East Inshore Fisheries Conservation Authority, so I do know that we can actually manage uh, our fishing stocks. And the IFCAs do actually have um, uh, patrol vessels. Um, the point that I, w I wanted to make is my father was a trawl skipper, so I do actually know what we've lost in this area. Uh, it's not just the fishermen, it's, it's, it's also the engineering side. Um, engineers from Grimsby, the fishing dock was a pool of engineers who went all over the world to earn a living. So that's another side that we've, we've lost. This area could call upon engineers or send way to the fish dock for completion and so that is a big deal that we've lost. So really the question I really wanted to ask, what I want to see from Brexit, and I'm sure Grimsby does, and I'm sure Whitby does, and I'm sure Scarborough does, we want to, to see a greater share of, of the catch. If we don't come out of Brexit without that greater share, then I'm sorry Brexit's a failure. So that's what I want to ask the panel. Will we come out of Brexit with a greater share of the catch? Thank you very much indeed. And in fact, you, you were going to echo my final point about Brexit being an opportunity for this area in particular to regenerate, not just in fishing, but a lot of other related industries as well. Um, <coughs> will Brexit have failed if we don't get a bigger share of the catch? And in a minute, I'll ask Martin yeah. about, about the local community. Barry, just briefly. There, there are two... Um, essential methods to determine quota shares. Uh, the one that is used internally within the EU is called relative stability and that is based on the historic catches in the five years running up to 1983. So historic catch. The other is called zonal attachment and that is um, a scientific assessment of, of the by species of the shares uh, in UK waters, and EU waters, Norwegian waters, um, and that, that is the percentage. A shift from relative stability to zonal attachment uh, overall would give the UK a huge advantage compared to where we are now, uh, and that has to be the objective. Over what sort of time frame? Um, I don't know. I think that is all part of the negotiations, but that's where we have to end up, and that would remove that situation in the, uh, the Eastern Channel that I mentioned before of us having 9% versus French 84%. Um, it's very interesting that uh, the principle of zonal attachment is currently the basis for the EU-Norway negotiations. In other words, EU accepts so there's this. So there's a precedent. There's there. a precedent. EU were perfectly happy to use this with Norway uh, until Brexit came along. Now, they're not so interested in talking about that. Okay. Dr Wakefield, is this an opportunity and will Brexit have failed if there isn't a bigger share? Well, I think the government's uh, intent on introducing zonal attachment. Um, the problem with it is that you have to put fisheries into um, the broader context of withdrawal from the EU and what it's willing to negotiate for. And historically, governments haven't done very much for um, fisheries areas. Mm -hmm. And it's not enough just to capture more of the fish and be able to land that here. There needs to be investment and there needs to be a transfer of funds out into the regions, which hasn't happened. Thank you very much. Richard, you know, you're a local MEP. 
could this be a good thing? It could regenerate your area, couldn't it? Well, as you've gathered from my comments, I'm wary of these claims. I think it's going to be more difficult. You can do, there's some things you can do whether you're inside or outside the EU. The, the raw deal that inshore fishermen, since you mentioned inshore fishermen, got, got is largely due to the way we've handled our quota internally within the UK by government decisions. Nothing to do with the, the EU rules. But the question, will, will we get a greater share of the fish? My, I would say we might get a greater share of the catch. Perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> Depends on the negotiation. You can tell he's a politician, the, can't you? Yeah, well, I, because I'm, just kind of, no, I'm, I'm wary, I, I, for the reasons I said earlier, I'm wary of the, of the claim that it's going to be easy. It's not for all the reasons I, I won't go over them again, I've said them. But even if we do, the economic value of that is unlikely to outweigh the damage caused to our ability to sell our fish in the rest of Europe if we, by our own choice, decide we're going to leave the customs union and not have a customs union with the EU. Because the tariffs you mentioned, the extra costs that that will put, even, even if, we get, if we manage to negotiate zero tariffs, the extra bureaucracy and red tape entailed by being outside the customs union won't be good for the businesses concerned. And um, I think that's where we risk the biggest hit to the fishing industry as a whole. So even if we did manage to get a little bit extra fish, which is not going to be easy, the, this will be outweighed by the economic damage of our ability to sell our fish. Okay, and finally to Martin. Well, to answer the point which is actually well made uh, about, the, about the engineering and about the, 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 what's happened uh, apart from the fishing, of course, the, there, is, there has been a great history of engineering in Grimsby and I'm pleased to be able to, to say uh, to the gentleman and to, to the people in the audience that our business in Grimsby, we invested over £2 million into a new shipyard only 18 months ago. So we've got optimism about the future. Uh, and actually part of that was funded by this council, which is a great thing. And as far as share of the catch in any increase, Grimsby has the capacity to handle more fresh fish, there's no doubt about that. Thank you very much. So we've heard today a little bit of history, we've heard the ins and outs of all the negotiations that are going to have to take place to bring uh, UK fishing into a post-Brexit era. I hope <coughs> you, you've enjoyed the discussion and learnt a, a bit from our panellists. Please thank them very much for being here.